right. I'm going to ask, can you get the PowerPoint up for Dr. Brenda Moore? And I'm just going to give Dr. Miley a call. As you can imagine, zooming in from Africa gets complicated at best. So we're going to have him on the phone and we're going to line up a mic. And then Dr. Brenda Moore is online with us. Hello. <laughs> we are all ready for you if you are ready for us. And we can, let me just put you on the mic here. All right, do you want to test that out? Hey. Can you hear me okay? We're, you're getting thumbs up here. <laughs> Fabulous. All right. All right. Well, I'll say good evening where we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Ryan Miley, and I'm on the I'm on just by audio. You'll see Dr. Mally Brindamore, pediatrician, uh, on video, and she's going to be taking over here in a in a few minutes. But I'll I'll just start by telling you first. I'm going to paint you a little bit of a picture of where I'm sitting. I'm in a one room house in rural Lesotho, which is a, a tiny landlocked country inside South Africa. And I am out in rural area tonight because I'm taking part in a walk. 200 years ago, a chief by the name of Moshe Shwe led his people from this area where we are tonight to Tababosio, where he established the kingdom that would go on to be the current kingdom of Lesotho. And so every year there's a, a walk and hundreds of people walk 116 kilometers over three days to celebrate this. And this being the 200th anniversary of the original walk, there's loads of people out to do it. So it's, it's a pretty neat adventure. Uh, and somehow I managed to use my very broken Sasutu to negotiate a little bit of time in somebody's house by candlelight to have this conversation with you. But unfortunately, video didn't work, and we'll just have to do audio. But in Lesotho for six months, uh, working with an organization called Partners in Health. We're going to tell you a little bit more about them and this work uh, during this conversation. But I'll I'll just dive right in. We Let me interrupt you. So if you quickly. could go to slide number. So or, sorry. Can I interrupt you so that I can just introduce you properly now that we know why you're joining via phone? Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. All right. Uh, so as you are he hearing, that is Dr. Ryan Miley. He's a family physician with a focus on health equity and a lifelong advocate for healthy public policy. He has practiced medicine in rural and northern Saskatchewan. Uh, inner city Saskatoon and rural Mozambique. He currently works as a tuberculosis consultant serving the northern Athabasca region, northern Saskatchewan, and at the Westside Community Clinic. Uh, Dr. Miley served as a member of Legislative Assembly for the Saskatoon Mewasan and a leader of the official opposition in Saskatchewan. He is the author of two books uh, with UBC Press, A Healthy Society, How a Focus on Health Can Revive Canadian Democracy, and a healthy future lessons from the front lines of crisis. And joining him is Dr. Molly Brindamore, who is a general pediatrician in Saskatoon, uh, where she has dedicated her practice to the care of underserved children and marginalized populations. She co-founded the REACH Clinic, where she provides team-based care to refugee children. And she was the first pediatrician at Sanctum 1.5, a supportive home for mothers and infants at risk or living with HIV. She works with the Saskatchewan Tuberculosis Prevention and Control Program as a TB consultant serving Northern First Nations communities. She sits on the board of Saskatchewan Preventative Prevention Institute and the Steering Committee of Stop TB Canada Partnership. So as you, I'm sure, noticed by now, Dr. Benuer and Dr. Miley usually live in Saskatoon with their sons, Zabe and Gus, uh, but this year they are in Mazaru Lesotho uh, 
they and they are supporting work with partners in health uh, at a TB hospital down there. So we are very, very lucky to have them join in today as it is the evening there. And so in an effort to not keep them too long, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Brunewer and Dr. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mackenzie, for that introduction. Apologi apologies for barreling ahead past it. Uh, hard to read the room when you can't see it. Um, so nonetheless, I'm going to continue to barrel forward, if you will bear with me. Uh, slide number two, please. Here in this slide, you'll see May Malerat. Mema Leratu has made the trek from her house to visit her neighbor Matsudisi twice a day for the last six months. It's only about a 20 minute walk, but the dirt pass through the hills of Bacha's Neck, Lesotho, that click, click is kind of hard to get in there, but that's the that's how you say it, Bacha's Neck. Can, the walk through the hills can turn treacherous in the rain and snow. Still, Mema Leratu hasn't missed a day. She takes her job very seriously. He's Matsudise's treatment supporter. She's been hired by Partners in Health to accompany Matsudise from the beginning of her care for multidrug-resistant tuberculosis to the end. Next slide, please. Matsudise is 25. She usually lives with her mom, her brother, and her two-year-old son, Chalel. But she's been staying on her own in a small house nearby since she was diagnosed with MDR-TB last July. This new illness came about six months after she'd been diagnosed with HIV and started antiretroviral therapy. I noticed I was losing weight, she told me, and then I started to cough up blood. She figured it was TB because those were the same symptoms that she had 10 years earlier when she'd been originally treated for drug-sensitive TB. At the hospital, she provided a sputum sample and a gene expert PCR test was done and was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes TB disease. This time, the bug was resistant to rifamp, one of the key drugs for treating TB. This meant she couldn't be treated with the regular drugs and would need to be enrolled in the MDR TB program. But she's not alone in this diagnosis. TB affects a quarter of the world's population, whether that's latent or active disease. MDR-TB makes up about 3.5% of the new cases and 18% of cases among people who'd had TB before. Lesotho has the highest per capita rate of TB in the entire world, has major, diagnosis, major challenges in diagnosis and treatment, something like 50% of the cases of TB in Lesotho got, go undiagnosed and has a very high burden of MDR-TB in particular. And the care of MDR-TB is not easy. Medications are difficult to, to take. The management of, the, of that care is not easy, and it requires, for patients like Motsudisi, a whole team. Next slide, please. The team we're working with in Lesotho is supported by Boston-based global health NGO Partners in Health which in Lesotho has three main activities. The first was the rural initiative, establishing primary care centers in some of the remote, hard to reach communities high in the mountains. Lesotho is a tiny country, about a 20th the size of Saskatchewan, but it can have some of the most remote areas you can imagine as the mountains are high and the, and the ways to get there are very challenging. There's the rural initiative. There's also health system strengthening, supporting the ministry in developing what PIH calls the five S's, the staff, stuff, space, systems, and social support required to provide good quality health care. And then thirdly, the delivery of MDR-TB care in Lesotho in partnership with the Ministry of Health. Next slide, please. If you've heard of Partners in Health, you'll likely have heard of co-founder Dr. Paul Farmer, an inspiring leader, actor, and thinker in global health. 
Sadly, we, we lost Dr. Palmer in 2021, but his legacy and work continues with Partners in Health and I really encourage you, if you get a chance, read his work. Uh, the book Pathologies of Power is particular, particularly in the book and, and a great combination of storytelling and, and thinking about global health or the biography of him called Mountains Beyond Mountains, one of the best books I've ever read. Next slide, please. Most of the work we do is on the ground, but some of it is at a very high level. And I'll pass it over to Mali to talk about that high level work. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for passing the mic. Um, thank you, Mackenzie, for the introduction um, and for the, the, the chance to be here. Uh, normally, uh, Dr. Miley and I live in the same house where I am in Maseru, the, in the capital of Lesotho. Um, but today, as he said, our circumstances are, are a bit special. So I'll, I'll take over the, the presentation now. Um, so Lesotho is entirely above 1,000 meters in altitude. And many of the communities that PIH serves are only accessible by Rocky Mountain trails, horseback riding, and sometimes by army helicopter or small planes. Now, if you're wondering why we're all wearing construction crew outfits uh, on there, it's not because it's it was safe as that way in the helicopter, like I thought when I got into that helicopter for the first time, but because we were supposed to also visit a construction site for one of the clinic's expansions. So we were very ready when we landed. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, and Dr. Melino that you see at the center of that picture is here, and who was also in the helicopter with me on that day, is the executive director of PIH Lesotho. And he's seen here demonstrating the use of POCUS uh, at the Partner Oncology Center next to the MDRTB hospital. These small portable tools are essentials in Lesotho as part of the toolkits that we use to decrease barriers to diagnosis, to treatment, and follow-up care. As you can imagine, it's quite a burden for patients to travel by foot or horse across the mountains to reach the capital in Maseru, where traditional, traditionally most of the diagnostic imaging tests, if they're available in the country, are done. In addition to that, the care team themselves need to be flexible and think about what equipment fits on a horse or how much they can carry themselves when they go support patients in remote areas. We can go to the next slide. And so, of course, supporting all of these patients with complicated treatments, uh, difficult diagnoses, takes a very big team. And if one of the first steps in MDR treatment, if we reach treatment for, for patients, is diagnosis. Here we can see Ntate Retabile, who's known as Steel by his friends and colleagues. He works in the lab. And if we look at the next slide, we can see his team at the Botsabello Hospital Lab. And one of the main tools that they use is uh, the gene expert PCR. And, and with that tool that we can perform on sputum or any bodily fluid, really, it's used to diagnose TB, but also which drugs the specific TB that this patient has is resistant to. They also follow many other key lab findings, including CD4 counts, viral load, because approximately three quarter of the MDR TB patients from the, MD the PAH program are also living with HIV. And so you can see this team standing in the Botabalo MDR hospital lab where samples from across the country are processed, but it also supports the rural sites and their mini, their mini labs, which allows them to process simple tests like CBC, simple chemistry. And in most cases, they also have a, a small gene expert machine to allow them for immediate diagnosis um, of, of tuberculosis. 
And then I can't help myself to say that a negative gene expert does not rule out TB, which is what I repeat to my residents over and over back home. But it's a very useful test when we talked about diagnosis of tuberculosis, especially um, in rural and remote area. We can go to the next slide, please. So some of the PIH patients are sick enough or a diagnosis or later in treatment to be admitted to the Botsabolo MDR TB hospital, where they are care. Uh, for by a large team of nurses, war attendants, x-ray techs, mental health counselors, cleaners, administrative and lo logistical leaders, as well as the medical team. The medical team um, has six general practitioners, one internist, one critical spare specialist, and for now, they have a pediatrician and family doctor. They also have an infectious disease specialist and a radiologist, all dedicated to look after the patients with MDRT. And it took this team and it took this hospital because patients with MDR used to face so much stigma. No one wanted to look after them, not only because the treatment is complex, it's long, it's poorly tolerated, but also because people are scared. They knew that the, the treatment was difficult to access and that a, a diagnosis of MDR-TB often um, is a death sentence. We can go to the next slide, please. Most of the patients at Butsabalo and within the MDRTB pro uh, program are adults. And this is Mae Seloane here that we see being examined by Dr. Ninza, who's a critical care specialist from Zambia who uh, has made Lesotho his home. So Mae Seloane, who's agreed uh, for us to share her story and her picture, has set, spent months in the hospital away from her family and her small three-year-old daughter so that she could recover from complications of DRTB treatment and meningitis. But Ms. Elwani has done well. She left the hospital last week and we saw her at the clinic yesterday. She traveled a, a couple hours on horseback before she got picked up by the team to make, to make it to the clinic to see us. She looked better and kept healthy for the first time in many, many months. And she was also wearing leather pants, especially for her clinic visit, instead of her very nice uh, MDR TB pink nightgown that we see her in here. We can go to the next slide. So if patients are mostly adults, we do occasionally um, see a child, uh, which I'm always very happy when this happens. Um, and this is Tota and his mother, Matota, who also agreed for us to share their picture and their stories. And they came um, to see us from one of the remote mountain communities to get worked up and have class treatment started in hospital. It goes a bit beyond the scope of the talk to discuss this, but there are very few pediatrics patients in the MDRTB program. And Tlotla is a rare exception. Not only was he diagnosed and got treatment, but he got better on his treatment. It's not because somehow MDRTB spares kids or they don't get it as much as adults quite the contrary. But because TB in kids is so difficult to diagnose, often the testing that we have is not adequate for them and is made for adults. The treatment is made for adults. So the majority of TB cases in kids, and even more so of MDR-TB, are not diagnosed. And these kids are missed. And you can imagine what happens if they are. We can go to the next slide. So the sickest of the patients are seen in the ICU, which is new uh, and has been uh, founded uh, during COVID and uh, provides the level of care that fits with the philosophy of PIH, the belief that everyone deserves to benefit from scientific advances. PIH promotes the notion of a preferential adoption for the poor in its medical services, believing that people shouldn't be denied good care because they live in poverty, that those most in need deserve the most help, and that those most in need should get the most accurate diagnostic tools, the latest drug, and the best treatment, treatment regimen we know. I really like this picture. A team of th three docs and a highly trained ICU nurse fo focusing on caring for one patient and putting their heads together to help him. And you can also see Dr. Meseret, the MDRTB program clinical lead. He keeps his eyes on the patient and a reassuring hand of his foot. Maybe it was his pulse because this patient was very sick as the patients are and should be at the center of everything we do. 
we can go to the next slide. At the pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy team will prepare the medication, including the highly specialized MDR TB drugs for the inpatient, but also the bulk of the MDR patients who are seen in the community. Um, they also operate rotating community clinics in nine of the country's 10 districts, so in most of them. And the pharmacist team is not only responsible for ensuring that all the meds are ready, that the docs don't make any mistakes in prescribing them, that the supplies are continuous, um, but they also uh, look after making sure that all of the equipment is available. So pharmacists in the situ are multi-talented. They're keepers of the warehouse, but also the providers of stuff, uh, one of the five S that Ryan has mentioned earlier. And we can go to the next picture, uh, the next slide, where we see Mempo, uh, who is one of the community nurses, uh, and as she's preparing the files, making sure everyone's labs and meds are up to date, also making sure again the ducks didn't forget anything, and keeping tabs on all of the community patients in all of the districts. Some patients are on treatment for upwards of eighteen months, uh, and the nurses are some of their strongest allies. They know them, they know their families, they support their mental health, they provide advice and care for social difficulties, they remember the names and age of their kids, and they're often the first to know about big life events. And Mpo means gift in Sisu too, which I quite like um, as a name for such a good nurse. We can go to the next slide, where we see... Uh, they're responsible for the waste warehouse who prepares the food packages, maize flour, sorghum flour, beans, peas, sugar, and oil, which each patient will receive every month throughout their care. Because malnutrition and food insecurity are major risk factors, both for catching TB and a major factor in success of failure or treatment. Without food, potent and fancy TB drugs would accomplish nothing. You can go to the next slide. Um, and we can see the full team after a week of pre clinic prep, they're loaded up and ready to go uh, and ready to head out uh, to the district health center. So they will travel between two and 10 hours to reach the patients, sometimes continuing their travel for several hours extra so that the patients only have one night of travel on foot instead of two. And if we can go to the uh, next slide, you can see what the roads will look like um, during these trips. Uh, but this is this is actually the best road in, in the Sutu. You don't see any potholes. They're not sheep in the middle of the road. This is actually when the travel is going well. But if you picture the mountain in the background and think that the road often is basically straight up the mountain on rocks rather than a paved road with, with sheep crossing the way. But fortunately, if we go to the next slide, we're in good hands with drivers like Ntate Machosa, who's, a keen high, uh, uh, who's keeping a keen eye for potholes and those crossing sheep and cows, keep, while well, keeping everyone awake and entertained with uh, Ama Piano playlist and conversation. So PIH is who employs about 20 drivers who go on community clinic, deliver supplies across the country and collect samples or sick patients. Sometimes they also act as ambulances. Then next slide. Um, we can see Ntate Lepizza and Ntate and Tatsi, who are two of the community nurses who are looking badass enough to tackle any mycobacterium that exists anywhere. And they're usually part of a team of two nurses, driver, and a doc who are in rotating clinic uh, all over the country. Now, if we can go to the next slide, we'll go back to our patient story and Ryan can take over. So for the last few months, a uh, couple of months, uh, this is the role that I've been playing as part of that community team. MLE has started doing that now as well as the work that she does in the hospital. And it's with uh, Ntati Lodica and Safi that we meet Matsudise again at Matcha Bang Hospital in Kachesna. After listening to her lungs and heart, reviewing her chest x-ray, renewing her prescriptions, next slide, we went to visit her in her home. One of the key beliefs of partners in health is the importance of accompaniment, of walking alongside our patients. I wanted to know more about Matsudisi's experience with MDR-TB and particularly with the PAH team. And it is a big team. She would only know the people she was directly in contact with, the community nurses, the people who diagnosed her in the beginning. 
But the people you see in today's presentation represent only a small part of a much larger operation. There are over 450 staff and over 125 treatment supporters working for PIH in Lesotho. Undergoing a treatment that involves taking medications daily from six to up to 18 months, not easy. The illness itself, medication side effects, and the near constant of underlying poverty and food insecurity make it even harder, which explains why as few as 70% of MDR-TB patients successfully finish their treatment, although that number is quite a bit higher with PIH and the intensive support that it offers. Next slide, please. All of these jobs are essential to Matsubishi's care, but none are as close to home as daily and dedicated as that of the treatment supporter. I never would have made it without her, is what Matsudisi said about Me Malaratu to me. Me Malaratu has become like her auntie. Quote again, she never missed. And it made me feel like someone was on my side. As for Me Malaratu, next slide, she has now accompanied several patients over the years. She receives payment for her work, and with a new baby at home, the money coming in goes a long way. She also, also appreciates the chance to make a difference. She said, I know that when I go to see the patients, I'm able to help them understand and to motivate them to take their medications. This accompaniment model is central to PIH's vision of care. The organization believes in paying local health workers and in providing for more than just the immediate medical needs of the patients. PIH's connection to community allows them to build the team that can deliver that care. It's not an easy time for Matsudisi. Completely, completing that MDR treatment is hard work, but she's going to be okay. Thanks to the care of people like Malawatu, community connections become personal connections. And those connections help patients like Matsudisi feel loved and valued and ultimately to be cared for and cured. Next slide, please. This work in Lesotho reminds us a lot of our TB work in Saskatchewan's north, where we find ourselves making new friends along the way. This is Carl, who uh, Melly dragged home from a clinic in Black Lake and, and stayed with us for longer than maybe was necessary. Carl has a good home now, and, and those connections matter. Next slide. Sure, there's more snow. There's no mountains but remote communities, a persistent problem with tuberculosis, and the need for a team-based approach, as we see here with our traveling crew of Nurse Leanne, medical office assistant Marvy, and x-ray tech Scarlett, I mean, there's a lot that Canada and Lesotho can learn from each other in the fight against TB. Next slide, please. And with recent increases in TB cases in Saskatoon, among people living with HIV, people who are having difficulties accessing housing, who are struggling with poverty and food insecurity themselves, we best be ready to learn and act quickly. Final slide, please. I want to thank the organizers for the chance to connect with you. We really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation. Again, apologies for the, uh, the technical challenges, but we'd certainly be happy to take any questions if there does remain a a couple of minutes. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Miley and Dr. Brindamore for providing us with the insight on your work in the SOTO. Um, I know I really enjoyed hearing about all the patient stories as I'm sure everyone else in the audience did too. So thank you again. Uh, we're going to open the floor now to any questions for our two speakers before we let them head to bed. Like we said, it is getting late there. Um, so if anyone has any questions, the mic's in front of you in person here. You have to press the button down and hold to speak. Um, and then re in Regina, uh, Cassie, I can let you know there, but uh, uh, those are just press and release. And then anyone uh, can turn their camera or their mic on via Zoom. Hello, everyone. My name is Parsa, international student of Master of Public Health here at USAS. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that the tuberculosis uh, among people in Saskatoon, especially people contaminated with HIV, 
uh, as a higher rate. And uh, the, my question is, is it any uh, specific policy that we can implement uh, or use here or even in some other places all around the world to decrease the numbers of people who are, who are contaminated to mycobacteria? Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. And that's a, that's a big question. Um, and I think has a, has a lot of layers to it. And there's work that needs to be done at the level of the clinical care, making sure that people who are seeing patients are well informed about TB. Often we don't think about TB in Saskatchewan. We imagine it's something that's gone, that it's, it's uh, either far in the past or, or far away across the world. So I think TB is, is a really important message and investigate for it and, and know that it can be there. Uh, that also means going beyond the clinic to where you're a student in, in public health. How do we do active case finding and go out and find the people who have active TB as well as latent TB off for the preventative treatment? And in particular, working with the highest risk communities, the highest risk groups. But of course, the answers to TB are not answers to TB in terms of medications and, and diagnosis as a whole, because these are this is a disease of poverty. This is a disease of food insecurity. It's a disease of inadequate housing. If we're ever going to eradicate tuberculosis in Saskatchewan, we have to deal with homelessness. We have to deal with the lack of opportunity in remote and on-reserve communities. And worldwide, we need to be addressing the inequality uh, and all of those other social determinants of health that are driving the spread of TB and other associated illnesses, including HIV. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big thing to tackle. Um, and we, as folks within the in public health, within medicine, within all of the helping health professions, need to be using both our clinical skills as well as our advocacy voices to fight against TB. Thank you. Just got another question in person here. Hello, Molly and Ryan. It's Ivy Burshow. I'm going to be speaking later. And thank you so much for the presentation. And in the spirit of South-North innovations, transfer of innovation, the important role that you identified as the accompaniment and how that role could be um, developed more fully, such as like a community health worker role for the lack of a better term. So here um, in communities where there's high rates of TB. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that as a South-North innovation transfer. So this is uh, actually something that oh, we Ryan, do go ahead, go ahead. Degrees. Sorry, Molly, go ahead. I, it's hard to know whether you're jumping in. No, go ahead, because I was actually going to repeat the question. You you go ahead. Okay, great. So the, the question is around community health workers, which is, is really an important model. If you're going to get into community and reach the folks that are hard to reach, you have to get people that know them, know where they live, know their relationships, know how to get a hold of them, have them as friends on Facebook, all of these things. Uh, we're actually, this is one of the parallels that we see with the work of TB in Saskatchewan and here in Lesotho, where there are TB workers as part of our program in the, in the communities that we work in. Uh, local people are hired as TB workers and they're essential. They do incredible work. Uh, tracking people down, visiting them every day to get their medications, bringing them to appointments. This can be expanded. You know, we certainly could do more of it, and it shouldn't only be for TB. We, we don't see it in many other circumstances in Saskatchewan. And in particular, in urban settings, uh, we could do a lot more community health worker style accompaniment and I, I believe reach, uh, reach people that that aren't being reached right now, uh, not only for TB, but HIV, for addictions, and mental health, for so many other conditions.
Tori, one second. That mic is not working. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, the light went on. Yeah, I'm used to pushing different kind of buttons, so I'm not used to this one. <laughs> I uh, was wondering if you knew the background of these people in Saskatchewan that are, or in Canada that are uh, like uh, having this TB, because maybe, because I think uh, I come from Sturgeon Lake First Nation. We have a lot of poverty there. And of course, as you know, Saskatoon, there's a lot of poverty here. So just wanted to get some idea. Well, knowing this would help me and help our communities know how to prevent that, or at least how to help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you hear your um, voice, Joseph? Great to hear your voice, Joseph. Uh, the people who have TB in Saskatchewan, it's really, it's pretty simple. It's mostly for people who are born in Saskatchewan. It's mostly people who are First Nations living on reserve. That's the highest risk, and in particular, northern communities, but not uh, not exclusively. There are also, and Mali can talk more about this uh, through her work with the REACH Refugee Clinic. There are people who are newcomers to Canada who come often with latent TB, so sleeping TB that then wakes up later on. Uh, when when they're exposed to other stresses, one of which can be moving to a new country and the, and the challenges of that. Um, we're starting to see some overlap between those populations where mixing between uh, between groups is is causing new challenges in diagnosis and new opportunities for spread. Uh, Melly, anything you want to add about the work at REACH and the latent TV work you've done there? Yeah, of of course. I think uh, I think the work as REACH is a is a very different population with their own uh, stressors and their own vulnerabilities. Um, in Canada, it's about seventy percent of of tuber new tuberculosis cases every year are diagnosed in, in people who are born outside of Canada, but in Saskatchewan, um, the numbers are telling us something a little bit different. Most of the new cases are from uh, communities um, in the north of Saskatchewan, and as Ryan said, on reserve. Um, and I think the, the the problem is poverty and the legacy of colonialism and racism. They all lead to TB. It's not normal to have outbreaks of tuberculosis where 50% of the cases are diagnosed in children. This is a deep marker of the inequities that um, we face and we live in in Saskatchewan. And we have the particular history in Canada of residential school. I don't need to remind anyone of that. But when it comes to tuberculosis, the sanatorium have done um, or have led to immense trauma. And the work that, that is done now has to kind of undo that, that trauma and makes it so much more difficult for patients um, and, and for providers to, to care well um, in a trauma-informed way. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Molly. And I just ask one more question if I don't see any here. Can you just talk a little bit about how you got into doing this work in Africa for all of us students who are like, wow, that looks like you're doing such important work and such cool work over there. Thanks. Maybe I can start then and then Ryan can um, can pitch in as well. Um, I think when you're a medical student, um, you have bright eyes and ideals and and then later during tr your training you're at risk of losing this um but as for myself i remember feeling like this when i was a medical student and then getting discouraged uh when i was a resident and then i found people around me that were lifting me up and 
wanting to do the same kind of work. And I, I feel like I have uh, found back this uh, desire to serve and reduce inequities that I had when I entered medicine. Um, and one thing that I remember thinking is, what is the path you know that that leads to doing this work? And there is no path. Everybody can choose their path. There is no direct way where it leads to you know doing global health or or working internationally. There is no path. You can you can do your own path, and that will be fine, and that will come. And I know that it's. It seems like it's far away when you're a medical student, but the time that you have in medical school and residency is to learn and think and, and cherish that. Um, and, and I think there's no need to stress about <laughs> what you will be able to accomplish later. You will be able to accomplish things. Um, yeah, I feel like it's a little bit of a rambling answer, but I hope that Ryan can maybe maybe should have been more light on that. Yeah, maybe more uh, directly. 100% uh, agree with the, the beliefs there uh, and the value of seeking out these opportunities early in your career while, you're, while your path is still being shaped. And I'm sure there are folks on the, in the conference today that are involved in making the links uh, that I think is a really important program, but it's certainly not the only option. Um, both Melly and I spent time when we were medical students, she in Rwanda and Palestine, and that really made a huge difference. Uh, returned to Mozambique together a couple of times. And then we were both working in tuberculosis And just as we were talking, we said, hey, let's... Uh... So sorry, do you want to back up just like two minutes? We lost you for just a second. Oh, okay, okay. All right, here I'm back. Um, I'll just do the real quick version of, of how we got exactly here. Uh, both working in TV, I just left politics, so had a bit of a, a transition moment, an opportunity to do something different. And we were talking about what can we do? And we both were big fans of Paul Farmer and Partners in Health. And we we called up the director of PIH Canada. And to our surprise, he was keen to invite us to, to join somewhere in, in their world. Partners in Health works in, in 12 countries around the world. And we looked at Lesotho with the high rates of TB and the specific MDR-TB focused hospital and thought this was a particularly good fit for us. Um, and it has been. It's been terrific. We, we love it here. It's a, an amazing country, many challenges, many difficult things, but it's a lovely place to be in so many ways. Um, and I think that's kind of, uh, like Melly said, you, you, you follow the, the things that, that draw you and the doors that are open to you, and you will find a place to serve and to, and to find value in that service. And, and find value for yourself in the work that you do. And hopefully, uh, more importantly, leave something good behind for the, the people that you came to serve. Last call for questions here. I'm not seeing any hands online, I don't think. Um, we should be good here. Okay, thank you so much yeah. once again. Um, for joining us and for calling in from so far away. And thank you again for all the work you're continuing to do and for sharing with, with us. Okay, as they say in Sisutu, have a great night. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.